uh, I'm talking about the I square record and, and uh, how I square scientists understand the, the current state of the our Earth and the future environment. Okay, the, in the left hand side, you can see the, uh, the global temperature change for the last 2000 years. So the temperature was relatively stable and they very recently increased more than one uh, degree C. Then you can see that the temperature increase since uh, late 20th centuries is, looks like a very unusual. It, it cannot easily explain by natural variations. Then you can consider what's the cause of this temperature change. So climate scientists use some models so, and supercomputers. So if you see in the right-hand side, the black line shows the observation. And then right, and, and then you can, uh, in the model, you can input some uh, climate forcings, some, some factors that may affect the climate change. So there are some human forcings and natural forcings. So if you input some human natural forcings together, the brown line here, looks better like the observation blank line, okay? But if you input only natural forcings, it doesn't change much. So the temperature rise around one degree C can be ex explained only by human forcings. So what is human forcings? We know the greenhouse gas concentration increase is mostly by human activity. So we know that carbon dioxide is an important greenhouse gas. Also, methane is very important. Nitrogen dioxide is also important man-made greenhouse gases. So these three guys and this uh, long-lived greenhouse gas actually attribute a uh, temperature increase around 1.5 degrees C. But there is screening of sunlight by uh, sulfur uh, particles. So last human beings use lots of uh, coals for combustion, they produce sulfur dioxide and actually they make some small particles in the atmosphere and reflecting sunlight that decrease temperature. The net effect is around 1.1 degrees C. So this is greenhouse gas, how the greenhouse gas affect climate change in the earth. Okay, and there was our future. This is also many people might saw this graph already, but let me shortly introduce. So, at the end of 20th century, 21st century, we expect the temperature rise. That depends on our carbon emission scenarios. So it shows here, you can see five scenarios. Each scenario has uh, produced some results in, in the models, but there's also some ranges because different models may give different results. And you can see the temperature would increase one and a half degrees C or up to five degrees C increase at the end of this century. Sea level rise would be half a meter to one meter at the end of these centuries. At the year of 2300, the sea level would increase up to seven meters, it de depending on carbon emission scenarios. But still lots of ranges. You can see the range is a few meters. So it's not good projection because our model, our understanding is it, not sufficient to narrow down this uh, range of the, our future, future projections. Okay, so greenhouse gas is very important, but how well we know about greenhouse gas? So actually the direct measurement of atmospheric air with instrumental measurement is with instruments actually started in late 1950s from here, okay? C.D. Killing, a Scripps Institution of Oceanography, he precisely measured the concentration. Around that time, the concentration was around 315 ppm. Now it's more than 400 ppm. And you can see the, the growth rate also changes, the slope change. So every year, annual growth rate now it's around two or three ppm per year. So it's increasing very rapidly. Now we have a question. We have this around more than 60 year record. 
but we feel that this is not enough to understand the behavior of carbon dioxide because if there is any perturbation of concentration to response to perturbation, this greenhouse gas, it may take hundreds of years. So we need record more than hundreds of years or a thousand years or more. So how can we get the record? And also what was the background level before this kind of increase? When it started, okay? To answer these kind of questions, we need a very long record. In 1980s, actually scientists uh, found uh, some method uh, using ice from Antarctica and Greenland. Especially Antarctic ice sample is very good because it's very clear. The dust flux is very small. It's very clean ice that has lots of bubbles here, okay? This is my finger. So you can see very small bubbles that has uh, preserves the ancient air inside. By drilling cores, we can get this very old ice and atmospheric air, fossil airs. Actually, now many countries are involved in this kind of research. It started from Europe and especially, especially uh, Switzerland and France, but now or also Korea, we uh, do this kind of research. Uh, Korea has two NI stations in Jangbogo and Sejong in Antarctica, and we do uh, involve this kind of research. Okay, after getting this ice in the laboratory, we uh, measure the concentration and isotopic ratios. So uh, the concentration itself is very important. Isotopic ratio gives us information about the origins and fate of this greenhouse gas. So it actually helps us understand the behavior and the control mechanisms of this important greenhouse gas. This is the ice core record for the last 800,000 years. So X, X is, is ages in unit of thousand years. So the time goes from the right to left because this is age. This is old one, younger one, okay? And then you can see the CO2 concentration for the last 800,000 years. And then anodic temperature and methane concentration and also ice volume in land. You can see uh, glacial interglacial cycles. You can see interglaciers and glaciers here. And NRE temperature and CO2 change exactly almost the same way. Methane concentration also very similar. So you can see here during glacial time, CO2 concentration was low. In glacial time, CO2 concentration was high. Okay. So CO2 played a very important role in climate change. But another important thing is this range is very constrained. CO2 concentration is between 170 to 300 ppm, okay? Not more than 300 ppm. But very recently, the concentration increased and reached up to 420 ppm. So we never experienced this kind of rapid rise for the 800,000 years. So this is very unprecedented. And also the speed of rise is amazing. Now that this is a different figure, so time goes from left to right, and this is CO2 and methane and nitrogen oxide. It's very really important greenhouse gas. And then you can see up and down during glacial interglacial cycles. And for the last glacial termination, you can see left to right. If you zoom up, you can see in this inset, show that the details of CO2 right. right. Actually, it happens 80 ppm increase in 7,000 years. But if you see more details, there is jump up short, very rapid rise. So the maximum rate of natural rise is around 10 ppm per century. If you compare this rate with a uh, risk increase for the last 100 years, it's more than 100 ppm per century. So risk increase rate is at least more than 10 times of natural increase rate. It's also 
the speed of CO2 rise is also very unprecedented. So what made this kind of change? So this is the record for the last 2000 years, okay? From year zero to year 2000, actually the data is up until 2019. You can see CO2 concentration was around 280 ppm and then increase more than 130 ppm for the last 120 years. So now the concentration increase around 47%. Methane increase more than 150%. Nitrogen oxide increase more around 23%. This are, all of them happened very recently for the last one or 150 years. We know the CO2 increase by many studies, scientists now know that is mostly by fossil fuel combustion and cement production. And methane from rice agriculture, landfills, and some rudiments, uh, like animals, uh, from cows to produce beef for our food. And nitrogen oxide also produce lots of use of nitrogen fertilizer that makes lots of reactive nitrogens, microorganisms, use that one and produce nitrogen oxide. Okay, all of them by human activity. And then this shows the, uh, the cycles of carbon. So carbon can be emitted by fossil fuel emissions, but also human activity like land use change can emit uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere because if you cut up the, the trees and build some buildings, and also if you uh, do agriculture in land, they may reduce the amount of carbon in unique area of the land because you cut off the trees and degradation of soil organic carbon, they may reduce amount of carbon in land. The carbon goes to the atmosphere. So that makes another type of emissions. And this amount of emissions and actually atmospheric growth is around 45% of them, not all of them. And then 55% goes somewhere. Actually, it goes, some of them, half of them goes to the ocean and also half of them goes to the land. So is it really good? The emitted carbon does not stay, all of them does not stay in the atmosphere, part of them. Uh, more than half of them goes to the ocean and land. But the problem is in the future, probably emission is increasing. We can expect uh, the uptake by ocean and land is not very efficient. For example, in this case, left hand side, you can see one of the carbon emission scenarios that shows very small uh, emissions. And then we can expect 70% of them would go land to the ocean. But if you emit a lot of carbons, only 38% would go land in oceans. More than 60% will stay in the atmosphere. So efficiency of this carbon uptake by land and carbon would decrease if you emit more and more carbons. So they may accelerate CO2 rise rate Therefore, global warming will be accelerated. Okay, you may say, what if, if, you, if you make no carbon emissions, for example, we achieve the goal of net zero in 2050, but many nations also have that kind of goals. And actually, but if then everything would be okay, so here is the, some simulation. Uh, if you see here, in this case, in this simulation, they made carbon emission to zero in the year of 2100, 2100, okay? And then the, the model results show that CO2 may concentration decrease, but it does not reach down to initial state. It's just halfway. At the end, at the year of 3000, and surface warming temperature does not change much, or it will decrease, but not much. Sea level rise continue for hundreds of years. Okay, 
why sea level rise continue again? Because the Antarctic ice sheet and Greenland ice sheet, it melts at warmer temperature, but it's very slowly warm, melting, okay? So even though the temperature increase not much, the, the slow melting increase level continually, okay? So actually to melt down all the Greenland and Arctic ice sheet, it takes thousands of years, even though there's lots of warming, okay? So it's our future. The problem is how much would we like rise, okay? So if we cut down the emissions, we may reach the, the small increase of sea level rise, but it happened hundreds of years. Okay, let me show this figure again, because uh, I just want to mention that there is lots of uncertainty in the model region. So different model produce different results because our model is not perfect, insufficient to narrow down the future projection, okay? Especially sea level rise, you know, there's a huge range here. Some model says, you know, in year of 2300, sea level rise more than 50 meters. We cannot exclude that kind of possibility. Now, let me show some challenges of our scientists uh, and then what we're gonna do. Uh, so, you know, that there's carbon emissions by human activity, therefore CO2 concentration rise, global warming. This kind of change may also carbon cycles. Carbon cycles is carbon exchange between atmosphere and ocean, carbon exchange between atmosphere and land. These carbon cycle change make additional CO2 rise therefore additional one. On the left hand side, you can see some model results with this uh, coupled climate carbon cycle, okay? If you include these feedbacks, you can expect CO2 concentration increase more. The right hand side, the results of model results with feedbacks minus without feedbacks, okay? All of them shows positive value. It means more CO2 rise by these feedbacks, therefore, additional temperature increase would be 0.1 to 1.5 degrees C. Huge range because we still don't know exactly the behavior of this carbon, carbon dioxide. Another issue is the tipping point. So this warming may change some part of the earth, but the change may happen not always linearly, sometimes very non-linearly change a lot, okay? So threshold temperature would be two degrees C or three, four degrees C. So you can see some uh, in Arctic and our region and some tropical regions, there is some uh, tipping element. Uh, if the temperature increase two degrees C, something change very quickly and the change never, never be uh, recovered even we cool down the temperature. So what's the, the threshold, what is the tipping element? To understand this kind of feature, we need the climate record in the past and observation and model-based studies. So this is also one of the challenges. Let me show the last uh, challenge in ice core community. So this is the uh, temperature change for the last 2,000, thousand years. So it's two million year record, you can see the glacial interglacial climate variations. But if you see here, the cycle was 41,000, but recently it became 100,000 year cycles. So what happened? So this is one of the puzzles in ice core community and scientists. So, the, but ice core record covers only last 800,000 years. There's no more uh, old ice core records. So now ice core community, looking for very old ice, more than 1 million year old one, in the East and like around this area. So Europe and United States and China, Japan, and even Korea are participating in some collaboration or their own uh, independent research work in the East Antarctica. So thank you for your paying attention. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk.